So you see on the screen it says, uh, there's a picture of DNA and the phrase, the Christian DNA, which I don't know if this is cheesy or not, but I just had this thought of using DNA as a metaphor for a series. But let me ask you, when you hear the word DNA, what does that mean to you or what do you think of somebody say something? You, say, you think of before time. Interesting. Someone else. You think of traits. DNA traits. Yeah. Someone else. Foundation. Yeah, that's good. Found, the, kind of the foundation of, of who people are, the, what, you, what you build on. What, what else? Identity. Heritage identity. Oh, I like that. Is anyone a chemist? What is, what is actually the letter stand for? I'm just curious. Shannon would know because. Oh, she said words that I can't even say. <laughs> the molecules that make up something called DNA. So you all know that DNA is, we're talking about part of um, what makes humans, part of what makes us what we are, and also um, the hereditary traits that determine things like our eye color, right, and how tall we'll be, and why I'm bald, and <laughs> that, comes, that comes from DNA genetics is another word that you hear. So, two definitions, so I sound mostly, so you don't have to sound really smart, I went to kids.britannica.com, and it says this, DNA is the material that carries all the information about how a living thing will look and function. So yeah, it's, it's, part, it's the genome, yeah, the human genome is the list of all of the various um, genes as far as, I, I don't know this stuff, so I'm like just past the boundary of my knowledge, so I'm going to say something that's probably wrong. But I think the human genome is a mapping of all of the billions of parts that make up DNA in, the, in humans and the genes and the chromosomes and all that stuff that is for hereditary um, traits. Another definition, this is from microbenotes.com, which I've never read before last night. <laughs> said DNA is a molecule, the ones, the things that, that Shannon was saying, is a molecule that contains the instructions an organism needs to develop, live, and produce. Instructions are found inside every cell and passed down from parents to their children. So I think you guys mostly have in this room have been to school and had to take a biology class somewhere, and you heard this phrase, doxyribonucleic acid, and DNA, and you know about a little bit about how you inherit stuff from your parents. You get a copy of each of your parents' DNA, and that determines what you're going to be like. Um, so moving to kind of a spiritual thinking, which is why I'm using this language, Jesus told a guy named Nicodemus one time, that when people put their faith in Jesus, they put their trust in Jesus, something happens that he called being born again, or born spiritually. So it just occurred to me, well, well, I guess if we're born again or born spiritually, perhaps we get like a spiritual DNA. And that might be something to, just to use as a model, as a, as a metaphor, if we want to talk about the kind of inherited characteristics and traits that those who've been born of the Spirit might carry. This, can we work with that? So, so I'm going to do like a series um, wrapped up with that concept to talk about the kinds of traits that would be typical of people that are followers of Jesus, Christians, the Christian DNA, the sort of the Christian DNA genome. And uh, that kind of opens it up where I could talk about anything in the Bible for like ever. So I'm not going to do that. But I have some ideas of some various focuses that are typical of the metaphor doesn't go all the way. Metaphors never do. They, they're helpful, but they're never perfect sort of mappings of the thing that you're using the symbol for in this way. So when you're born, you get your DNA, and, and it doesn't generally change. Actually, it can change from mutations. And it turns out, I'm going to go down another trail, but it turns out you can actually change your DNA for the future recently discovered for future generations by how you think. And if you move from being a very negative person to being a very positive person, and think about truth and positivity, they've recently discovered that you actually change your DNA for your children. Isn't that remarkable? 
people. Now, so the, the metaphor doesn't work, I was saying, completely, because when you're born spiritually, you put your faith in Jesus. Most of you in this room probably have that experience at some point in your life. Things definitely change. It's like you get a new DNA. Uh, you have new characteristics, new fruit of the Spirit. You would know that language, maybe kindness and gentleness and Christ-likeness. But you also begin a process as Matt Evans likes to say, of being saved. Because salvation, you've heard him do that, right? Salvation is an event. We grow and we renew our mind. And we do what we're doing right now. We're going to read some from the Bible. We encourage each other. We pray. We worship. And that seems to affect our spiritual DNA. So there's kind of a process. And by looking at some of the things that would be in the spiritual DNA, what it looks like to be a follower of Christ, we will be changing our DNA, possibly, because we will be growing and, and taking into ourselves and the Spirit of God putting into us new characteristics, I'm hoping. I hope that for me all the time, because I'm hoping always to be transformed is that that's maybe why you're here. So, um, so what I want to do today is talk about a particular quote-unquote gene, the missions gene. It's convenient, of course, I'm using this because we're talking about missions over a season. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk with Steve Rogers, who just got back from Honduras. So Steve, if you could come up, hopefully you have a microphone so people can hear you online. I, I especially liked... Um, that video we saw for, for who we were praying for, can you, I hope you were paying attention, see if your memory works. Do you remember seeing a guy named Melvin that we were praying for and then with two other young men? Can you picture that? There was two other men. They're all about 20. And some of us that begin working with them when Breath of Heaven started met those boys when they were little boys. And now... They graduated from high school. So wait a minute, let me back up. They were living in the poorest of the poor on the planet in the worst conditions where generally children are so cold they sniff glue to give their brain the feeling that they're warm. They have zero education, no reading or writing, living on sometimes a dollar a day, starvation, living in the streets, living in the slums. And the organization we work with which is a missions organization, was able to put those boys in a home, not an orphanage, but a home. And they grew up with a family kind of environment. And they went to school. They're in college now, um, some of them. Uh, Melvin, in fact, he's, he's enough in college that he changed his major, <laughs> just like we do. <laughs> and now he's studying agriculture. And also some mechanic stuff so that he can fix farm equipment. But he's got a career in mind. And Morris was next to him. I think Morris might be studying law. Yeah, Morris studying law. Mika was next to him. He's, I, especially, my heart's big for him because he's a, one of the boys. He's the boy that we sponsor in our family. So we've gotten to know him. And it turns out he wants to be a pastor. So that's something. <laughs> but he also wants to get a sort of a backup career so he can, you know, eat. <laughs> But we've, we've, we've opened our hearts to people that are far away from where we live. They've been loved and cared for, and they've all met Jesus. They could all teach the Bible right now. They're all followers of Jesus. They love him. They're worshipers. And it's because of the missions gene. Get it? So Jesus cares about all the people of the world. God wants everybody to be rescued from the darkness that's in this world. Every single person. He wants everyone to know about him, and he's very concerned about his glory. Because when people don't know about the glory of God, they think all there is is this world we see around us, and it's not so much. And if all that we have to live for is what we see around us, there's not a lot of reason to live. But when you get a glimpse of the glory of God, when you get a glimpse of who Jesus is, doesn't it change everything? And God wants everyone to know him. God's passionate. God's concerned about the mission 
of making followers, disciples of Jesus, of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. That's what we mean by missions. The missions gene would be that characteristic in us that joins us to Jesus' mission with passion and commitment. And it's my belief that it is normal, normal, normative. It's the way we are to be if we're followers of Jesus, that we join him in his mission and we have a passion and a commitment that every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation knows the glory of God, worships him, and is transformed, finding life, finding reason, finding purpose, and becoming transformers of others. I mean, that's, that's the way it works, right? So that's the missions gene. So this is Steve Rogers, who is not Captain America, but I think he is. How y'all and, doing? And um, his shirt says, Honduras, because you were just in? Honduras. Oh, is your mic on? I believe so. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, although this T-shirt isn't from this trip, I oh. didn't make one. This is from the last trip. Well, you didn't have to tell them that, but I guess it's okay. So, st- so full st- disclosure. So we have joined a partnership with other churches. Actually, just one church. It's a small partnership, but it's a big church. It's a church of churches, really, of thousands of people in Phoenix. And we've, after a long period, it took, I don't know if it was 18 months or a year, but our missions leadership prayed about joining one of the vineyard partnerships. So vineyards, um, vineyard churches in America, there's about 600 or so vineyard churches in America. There's over 3,000 around the world, and they uh, come from places like people in America caring about people in another country because we care about Jesus' mission. And we support and help other places grow as disciple makers. So Steve was invited by, who was who invited you? Uh, Pastor Cesar. Cesar, where does he live? He lives in La Esperanza, Honduras. So he invited you to come? Yes. Does it feel like I'm like prompting you and it's hard to talk because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Want me to get out of your way? <laughs> no. Okay. So well, just tell us about... Um, what he's doing and what, what you did when you were there. and uh, you, you told me, I know a little about the answers, but we'll see where this goes. So he's got like these groups in the mountains or something. Yes, he uh, is ministering to the Lenka, the Lenka, which is the indigenous people of that area of Honduras. And um, they live in the mountains around La Esperanza. And um, right now they do not have a vineyard church for them. But he has started three small groups that look like they're going to be church plants. Well, I said, what happened to his church? Um, COVID happened to his church. He, so, he was a part of a church, and it fell apart as COVID was going on. So, so we care about the mission of Jesus and the people that are involved in the mission of Jesus. So here we have a brother, Cesar, leading a church in a city, Las Esperanza, right? Mm-hmm. COVID happens... Country goes on hard lockdown, don't have the supports that we have in our country. And the people just kind of scatter. So they're not meeting anymore, but yet he's still ministering in these other places. So, so what did you do with him? Um, well, uh, what's very different is I was able to stay in his house with him and eat with him. And I went to all the different houses he ministers at. And it was interesting. Everyone wanted to feed me, which is... You know, uh, so this I, was, is why I suffered you might for want Christ. to get involved in missions. Um, their food is uh, delicious, and um, I actually lost two pounds. I don't know how I did that, but because <laughs> I ate like a king. Which, by the way, um, Cesar and his family are watching on Zoom oh, right hi. now or Sorry. Facebook. How y'all doing? Good to meet you. Thanks for sending Steve back and taking good care of him. So. You went to these three, they're kind of like house churches at this point? Yeah, um, one of them is just one family so far. Um, He's up in, uh, way, way up in the mountains. He's a farmer, and his name is, I hope, I know I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but they call it, his real name is Purification, and they call him Puri. Puri. And uh, he's awesome. And... uh, we went out there and had a meal, and but uh, the other two church plants that he's working on, um, 
It's like you're going on the highway, and all of a sudden there's this tiny little dirt drive-through or driveway, and you, you pull in, and behind the trees, there'll be like six, seven, eight houses, whatever, like a little neighborhood or a village. And you kind of get the feeling that maybe this was one family that grew and grew and grew, and then they moved away, and people bought the houses. And um, they're, they're small little houses. And um, these are turning into church plants. It's, it's kind of amazing. He makes a contact in one of these little villages, and next thing you know, he's there once a week uh, to bring the word, and their neighbors are showing up. So it's really cool. You know, that's how, like, Methodist used to, that's how the United States West became um, evangelized with Methodist circuit rider preachers going on horseback from town to town, kind of, kind of like what you're doing, Cesar. You have rich history that you're joining with. And so, Cesar does it on a motorcycle, so it's kind of like being well, a yeah, circuit that's rider. A, it's a modern horseback. So, so y- you know, um, in our environment, it would be very common for us to um, pray for sick people and expect that God would show up. More than, so, uh, you might not know this if, you're, if this is kind of your first church environment, but, but some Christians believe, yeah, God could do that, but they don't have much expectation that God will do much in the way of healing and touching people. So they might say, dear God, we pray that you guide the surgeon's hand, which is a good prayer. But there are other kind of groups that think the kind of experience you see in the Bible might be able to happen today where we lay hands on people, we invite the Spirit of God to come and touch them, and we, we hope that a healing will come, right? So, so they, as I understand, they were hoping that you would come and sort of show them how to do that, sort of teach them, right? Yeah, they wanted me to help them bring more vineyard DNA to their situation. Ah, so and I won't go into DNA since Ron just explained it. <laughs> I'll just call it Christian DNA, yes. you know, Bible, <laughs> Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, so you, um, you went to their their house meetings and did some of that, and then also there was a gathering. Tell us, tell us about how that worked. Yeah, I went to some house meetings and I went to um, individual houses where there wasn't any uh, gathering. They just, people invited me to dinner. <laughs> it was awesome. And, uh, and then um, the one main event we did was towards the end, uh, we met in a restaurant with uh, people from each group and from outside of those three groups that uh, Cesar would consider a leader um, or he's working towards growing them into leadership. And I gave a teaching on vineyard leadership which, um, I'll be honest, I stole almost everything that I used what we do. from a guy named Glenn Schroeder who wrote a book about uh, Wimberg quotes. W- Wimberg, if you don't know, uh, kind of the founder of the Vineyard Movement. So he had a bunch of, he's not alive anymore, but he had a bunch of really fun little pithy quotes, pithy short phrases that pack a lot of meaning. So you could, you could do a teaching saying some of his quotes like, the phrase you hear around here sometimes, everyone gets to play. You've heard that? That's a Wimberism that just is a short way to say, you know what? The, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is for everybody, not just the professionals. So everybody gets to play, right? And everybody should play. So that's the kind of stuff he's talking about. So uh, did you, what did you do? Did you pray for anyone? Did anything uh, happen? Yeah, at the I end the of this teaching, um, I did the same thing I did at all the other meetings. And... Um, during each teaching, especially this one, I talked about how at the vineyard, one of the defining things is everyone gets to play. And the other defining thing is we expect that the Holy Spirit will do something every time we pray. Ooh. And so at the end of it, I would say, okay, you said you have this going on, headaches or whatever. And we'd put them in a chair uh, like we used to do at Jose's home group. <laughs> and uh, we called it the hot seat. And uh, I would start to pray and invite the Holy Spirit. And then next thing you know, someone who's never prayed this way, uh, I would have them put their hand on a shoulder and, uh, as Wimber would say, whammo. Uh, (laughs) People would get healed. It was awesome. Uh, Wow. At one of the meetings, a woman's deaf ear opened up. Come on. Um, A uh, uh, a woman was getting ready to have her procedure on her colon, and she was in a lot of pain. Um, I don't have the stuff to find out if her colon actually was healed, but the pain went away. So that's a, that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, another one, we were praying for a man who had a 
injury and in a work injury in his arm, and there was a lot of pain. And um, uh, we prayed, and uh, he said it got a little bit better. And then we prayed, and he said it got a little bit better. And so we prayed some more, and the Spirit told me that there was an issue of unforgiveness. And he's a new Christian. So I talked about, um, I felt like he had something from his childhood that he was, had left unforgiven. And all of a sudden, bam, there was all these tears. And um, he was wailing. Wow. And he agreed to forgive everyone, and the pain went away. That's pretty cool. So am I right that for, for a lot of the prayer, it was actually the people that were... Yes, it wasn't they were doing just it. me. It was me and them in concert. I, I tried to focus on training people rather than being the man of God. Yeah. Because yeah. you guys know that. me, so, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't do I am the man of God no, very well. We don't like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that guy. No, everyone gets to play. I, I do much better at the guy tripping on the stairs on the way up here, which you guys didn't see on Zoom. But, uh, and, uh, and then saying, hey, you should do this. Yeah, I'm way better at that. So, so that, I feel like I keep losing my sound. Maybe I'm sitting on the antenna. That's probably Lord, we pray that this microphone is healed yeah. in Jesus' name. Okay. So, <laughs> some of you might wonder, what does it look like when we talk about going on a missions trip? And it might look like what he just described. You know, if you, when you read the Bible, you'll see Jesus shows up at someone's house for dinner. A lot, of the, a lot of the teaching you see in the Bible from Jesus is him having dinner at someone's house. And in the course of dinner, he talks, of, talks to them. Gives them. Next thing you know, there's someone that needs healing, or their broken heart needs mending, or there's a brokenness from their past like that you couldn't know, but God knows, and he might tell you. And so that's the kind of stuff that we do here, right? But it's Missions is just doing what we do here in terms of making disciples out there and supporting others to do that so that the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's what missions is. And Steve's a regular guy like you and me. And we're invited to go back to Honduras. Would you like to go with Steve to Honduras and do that? So that will come in the future and you'll be able to do it, and you'll find yourself, you, you wouldn't use that language because you haven't changed, but you go, I guess I'm a missionary, right? Because now Steve was just a missionary, but he's just Steve. Just Steve. But he's doing the work of Jesus' mission somewhere else than right here. Make sense? That's the missions gene in action. Anything else you want to tell us that I wasn't thinking about asking you about? Um, well, uh, a number of you were praying for me, and uh, the main thing that I asked for was vision because that's something Cesar was asking for, that I could come and look at his situation and help him find a vision for where he was going with all this. And um, I told you guys I was not the guy to do that. I'm not qualified. And, well, God did what you prayed for. Come on. And um, he, is, he didn't realize he had the beginning works of um, three church plants there. And so now he knows where to go with that. He's taking all of these groups through an official discipleship plan he had, that he has. And so now on his property up in the mountains, he wants to open a discipleship school. Um, that was the vision that we got while we were working together. That sounds like growth to me. This school will take care of people who are uh, Honduran, and it will be a, a long-term session. And then also he wants to set up like a two-week or three-week school for people flying in to do missions work and uh, go learn how to disciple people. So, so with a partnership like this, the goal is to help the local people, the indigenous people, the people that live in the country we're talking about, Honduras in this case, become completely self-sustaining, multiplying church movement. So when they are making disciples who make disciples who make disciples, when they are sending out pastors, when they are multiplying communities of faith, churches, worshipers, then it's going good. And then finally that's released in our terminology to its own association of churches and, and we move to the next place. We want to see the world filled with the glory of God.
So the difference between us going there now in the situation they're in and then them having their own association is then they no longer need us. We're still in relationship, we still visit, but they're on their own and they can do it. So, so in our um, system, if you could use that language of the vineyard, which is just, remember, vineyard is just one really small association of churches in the world of churches. They're, we're just one little piece, but we're, that's our piece, and it's an important piece. It's a good piece, but it's not the whole thing, you know. But in our system, already God has seen fit to do what we just described, of releasing churches in nations to be their own movement. I think in 16 nations now, and that, or 16 groups of nations, 16 nations or groups of nations, and that's why there's about 3,000 of the churches being planted that are actually up and running. So, you know, let's pray for Cesar. I didn't know you'd be watching us, and I know you sent me a video. I haven't been able to see it yet. I think Steve got it recently, but I'll watch all that. So I just want to work in this room, and you can't see him. There's, I don't know, 70 people or so in here, and we're going to pray for you right now. Okay, so join me in blessing the church that Cesar, Pastor Cesar, pastors and the people that he's caring for. Father, we thank you for our brother. We thank you for his family. We thank you for the family of churches that he is overseeing, that he is discipling, that he's blessing. And we pray favor upon this movement of churches. Each one of these groups of people in the mountains, the Lanka, fill them with your spirit. Open their eyes to understand your word. Give them a heart to multiply the gospel to their neighbors and their family members and their friends and those that they don't know yet. Lord, let there be a movement of Jesus in the mountains around La Esperanza. And bless Cesar's vision for the school of discipleship, for the training that he's planning. Encourage, build up, and provide for them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Could you, could you shut that back? Thanks. <laughs> so, Thanks. was that fun? You can applaud. Oh, one other thing. Oh, come back. Um, but there's more. <laughs> Josue Hernandez and Jenny Hernandez from uh, North Phoenix Vineyard have asked me to go back in late uh, January with Josue. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, but it'd be awesome if you all started praying now. Thanks. Oh, that sounds good. Thanks. So I'm going to talk just a little bit more about this missions gene thing, but not a ton more. So take a breath if you thought, oh, now he's going to talk for 40 minutes. Great. <laughs> not going to do that to you. Well, maybe I can. What do you think? Um, I'm also praying, my family and I, about possibly taking a team to Zambia in August, which is I don't know how many months away. Oh, Michelle wants to go. <laughs> so some of us have been at the Breath of Heaven children's ministry where you saw those three boys. There's, right now, there's, I think, about 100 kids that we are caring for, um, and some of them are now transitioning into adulthood, so we're still caring for them. There's about 400 students that go to the schools that we have, a, a grade school and a high school, that have all been built up through our missions program. And, and missions, I mean, the, the whole program of Breath of Heaven, not just us, there's people all over the world working on this. But we are invited to go and play with the kids and encourage them. And I've met a new vineyard pastor in the capital city of Zambia, Lusaka, very near to where Breath of Heaven is. And he said, would you please bring a team of people when you go to Breath of Heaven and come and work with our church? It's a vineyard church plant that started in COVID. And they would love, it's a Seho Minyoi. He'd love us to join his, uh, his church fellowship there. So, you know, as you're praying, pray for that too. So, we're talking about the missions gene, and I want to just bring up some thought from the scripture about that. And... Hopefully do this in, I'm looking at the clock, 10 minutes maybe. So it, if you don't know, the idea of missions starts in the beginning book of the Bible and goes all through it. When God called a man, oh, thank you. When God called a man named Abraham to follow him, Abraham 
was of the pagan pool, you could say, but he had a heart that would connect with God. And God chose him, and from him said, I'm going to make out of you a nation. Here's the language when, when God called Abram, was his name, until God changed his name to Abraham. Abram, by the way, means an exalted father. Abraham means father of many nations. So when the promise of God came to Abraham, he literally changed his name. Think of, if your name had meaning and God called you and changed your name to a new name with meaning for your whole life purpose. So in Genesis 12, we read, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. He's an old man, by the way. And this is a wonderful story to read. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open up to Genesis around chapter 12 and just read the story of Abraham. It's phenomenal. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And here comes one of the first thoughts, beginnings of the concept that God was creating a people to be missionaries, to have a missions gene to bring God's blessing to the whole world. The next sentence, I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And if it didn't connect in your brain when I read that, this is literally being fulfilled in a profound way today because even us talking right now are the result of Abraham. Abraham grew into a nation through his children. From his offspring came Jesus the Messiah, came the people of God, came the word of God that we have in our hand today. And God blessed the nations. And so, so it starts. Um, there's, we could read tons of scriptures. And we, won't, you know, we could take weeks and weeks and weeks developing God's heart for the nations and the peoples of the world. But I'm, I, we'll do that perhaps another time or see that through. But just know that it's from the beginning to the end. And here's just a couple highlights. Many of you know this psalm, Psalm 4610. Be still and... Be still and know that I am God. You, you've heard that, right? It's a great psalm, and it's about turmoil in the world and God responding. How many of you know what comes after that sentence? So the next sentence is this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted among the nations. Do you hear the missionary God there? I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, Jesus, you know, we've read a lot of his stories, and you have, and most of you in this room online perhaps know Jesus. Jesus gathered his 11 apostles with him on a mountaintop, and we read this brief encounter at the end of Matthew's gospel. All of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have some version of this story um, to greater or lesser detail, but Matthew seems to grab the details best. Jesus came to his disciples and said, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I'm the king. I've been given all authority. Therefore, you go. And I've told you before, it's almost laughable. He's got 11 guys who are doubting, 11 guys from a backwoods area in the Middle East. In a small town, in a, they have no influence in the world. They have no influence in their nation. They're outcasts. There's 11 of them, and he says, I want you to go to all the nations of the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. What are they supposed to teach the disciples? Can you speak? I'll read it to you again. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. What are they to do? So everything that we read in the New Test in the Gospels of Jesus' teaching, which wouldn't be completely um, comprehensive, but it'd be a lot, they are to teach new disciples everything that he taught them. 
What's the last thing he taught them? We just read it. Go into all nations and make disciples and teach them everything I taught you. So if you're a disciple, you are to be taught to make disciples, teaching them everything you were taught. Did you catch? This? So that's, that's where the missions gene got injected into you. And do you see how it reproduces parent to children? Disciple, it, it goes on and on. All of the teachings of Jesus are to be taught to the next generation of disciples. The last teaching of Jesus is that they are to make disciples and teach them all of the teachings of Jesus. So then they get that, and the last instruction they get is, go and make disciples and teach them everything I just taught you. You get it? That's the missions gene. If I'm a follower of Jesus, it would be, I would have a genetic mutation <laughs> if I didn't care about disciples being made of every tribe, of every tongue, of every people group all over the world. So when you hear me say it's my hope that everyone in our church is connected to missions, I'm not joking. If you're called to Jesus, and you're called into this family in particular where I have some responsibility to teach you what I've been taught, then I'm teaching you to make disciples of all nations and teach them everything that Jesus taught the first disciples and the second disciples and you, and that you would care about that, that you would be committed to it, you'd have passion about it, because well, you know, when someone talks to someone about why they look a certain way or act a certain way, they might say, I was born that way. It's in my DNA. Well, now you can say, well, I was born again that way. <laughs> it's in my DNA. The mission gene. Spiritual gene. Spiritual DNA, Christian DNA. So later on in the story of the growth of the Jesus movement, of course, most of you know, we meet a guy named Saul, whose name is changed to Paul, and he becomes the guy that wrote much of your Bible in the New Testament, the letters. You know, the book of Romans, for example, was Paul's writing. When we studied about what grace means, we studied mostly Paul's teaching. So so Saul, who changed his name to Paul later, was an opposer of Jesus. Um, if I had time, I would love to read to you one of the three times in the book of Acts where we hear his story. It's a phenomenal story of how we went from hating Jesus and thinking that as a good Jewish person he should stop this movement to being completely taken in by Jesus, Jesus stopping him in his tracks, inviting him to be a follower of Jesus, him recognizing, eyes being opened, that all he has studied in the Hebrew Scriptures, the part that we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures, all spoke of Jesus the Messiah. He fulfilled every description of the Messiah. He was indeed the Son of God, the Messiah of God, the one called to bring redemption to this planet. And Paul got the missionary gene injected into him. And... He was told at his new birth, kind of what I'm telling you, he was told, Paul, I'm going to send you to all of the nations. Now, if you know the word Gentile, um, that, that's a word in English that in the, in the Hebrew would come out as the nations. So there was the Jewish nation and the rest of the nations. That's how they thought. And Paul was going to be sent to the rest of the nations as well as the Jewish nation. He was told that from the beginning. Later on... He wrote about this process of being committed to Jesus' mission. And I want to read that to you in uh, Romans 10. This is, a, this is a, a few sentences I'm going to read to you. This is Romans 10, verse 9 through 15. Again, in the New Living Translation. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. 
It's by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. As Scripture tells us, anyone who trusts will never be disgraced. Trust in him, in Jesus. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who generously calls all who call on him. He gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is where we often stop reading. Listen to the next part now about the missions gene. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? You hear the missions gene there? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? He introduces a new thought there. Did you catch that? Apparently in Paul's thinking, some people are sent and some people are senders and some people are both senders and sent, right? Most of us are. But certainly there's a role of sending. Did you see that? How will they go unless they are sent? When we talk as a community about, well, how should we be involved in Jesus' mission? We talk about sending. I mean, that's why we collect money, to send people. Because some people are the sent ones. And I don't know if you know this scripture, I didn't put it on the screen, but in 1 Corinthians, I've got it right, 9.14, Paul writes this, Don't you know that the Lord has commanded, the Lord Jesus has commanded that those who preach the gospel are to make their living at the gospel. I don't know if you've ever read that. It's in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 9.14. Some people are called to leave their day job and go to a place where they spend all their time, all their energy, all their resource on making disciples. When that happens, how can they go unless they're sent? Get it? So you and I, if we have the Christian DNA, if we have the missions gene, care about Jesus' mission. And we will pray for, or we will financially give, or we will send Christmas cards, or we will welcome those that are sent into our homes. We will pray, care, love, be concerned about. It's on our mind that God cares about the world. That's why in our community, we make it a point every time we gather on Sundays to think about someone else than us, right? So we watch a video for some nation or we pray for some sent one, some missionary, because it's the missions gene. As far as we can tell, part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to care about the nations. Every tribe. Every tongue, every people. So I'm going to give you, oh, look at the time. I'm going to give you three things really fast. You ready? I'm going to tell you why I'm committed to Jesus' mission. And there's three reasons I'm going to give you. The first is that I love Jesus. The second is that I trust Jesus. The third is that Jesus is Lord. So the first, I'm committed to Jesus' mission of making disciples of every nation because I love him. Do you love Jesus? Has he, has he like become so wonderful to you? Here's his words, John 14, 15 in the message translation. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. If I love Jesus, and it's not in my mouth only, but it's an actual action, love is to will the good of the one you say you love. Catch this now, love is not just an emotion. Because if you're a chocolate cake and you hear me say, I love chocolate cake, and then you see me with a knife and a fork in my hand, (laughs) you know that I love you and I want to consume you. And that's a different kind of love than to will the good of the one we love. Do you get it? So one is sort of an affection about me. And one is a decision to do something at my own personal cost about you. If I love Jesus, 
I'll do what he said. If you love me, do what I told you. Second reason is because I trust him. I could talk long on because I trust Jesus. You know when Jesus said, don't have sex with someone until you're married to that person, and you think, that seems like a dumb idea. It'd be much better. I, I really like sex. But I trust Jesus. So if he says, I've got a better way for you. I've created sex for marriage. Trust me in this, and you'll be blessed. So I go, you know what? I don't understand everything he says, but I'm going to trust him. Following Jesus, especially when you want to do something that's against what he says, is called faith. Putting faith in Jesus. In America, we commonly talk about people becoming Christians by accepting Jesus. I'm not sure I like that language, because if anyone's doing any accepting, Jesus is doing the accepting, and he's accepting me. I put my faith in him. I trust him with my whole life. When I'm leading someone to follow Jesus, I say, hold on, this is expensive. If you are believing me that he is God, that he died for you and rose again to take away your sins and would like to give you new life, I'm asking you to trust him with your life. I'm asking you to hand him the keys to your car and get in the drive, passenger seat and let him drive. I'm asking you to trust in him so that he's in charge because he's a good driver and you're not. <laughs> right? The reason we're having this conversation is because you crashed your life. So trust him with your life. Listen to this verse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. I believe that when I trust in Jesus, the response the effect in my life is joy and peace, and I'm all about joy and peace. I'm all about joy and peace. And it comes, at least in part, from trusting Jesus and doing what he said. I am committed to his mission of making disciples of every nation because I trust him. The last one, I'm committed to Jesus because Jesus is Lord. Now, I, I gave the guys a picture of a starry night. Maybe they can show that. This is a kind of a mountainy scene. There's a city in the bottom. That's just a small glimpse of our um, Milky Way. Look at all those little dots. Have you ever been on a starry night? Have you ever been in awe? So each one of those little dots that we can barely see is like one of our suns. Imagine that. Our sun's kind of big, huh? And, and the people that should, they're supposed to know this stuff tell us there's somewhere between 100 billion and 400 billion of those stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And Jesus said, I made all that. I spoke it into existence. Whoa. I did that. I built that. <laughs> That's just the stars. We do well to be in awe of the God that created that and says, by the way, you're accountable to me. We're the only place in the universe where apparently people have been given the option to act like their God. And if they want to, to close their eyes, turn away and say, no, this is my life, I'm in charge. No, you're not. Somewhere people have to come to terms with the fact that you are created by God for God and you are accountable to him for what you do with your life. Which doesn't sound like how we usually talk in our culture. Don't hurt people's feelings. <laughs> Incorporated in that is the concept of the fear of God, the awesome reverence. Now, um, I need to change a light switch in my house. And I'm not living in fear of electricity, but I fear electricity. Because it's powerful. And if I cross it, I'm going to get hurt. God's powerful, and if you cross him, you're going to get hurt. He's full of love. 
He's so loving that the God that created all that said, these poor people are so confused. They don't know what they're doing. They sin. They hurt each other. They rob. They steal. They commit adultery. They murder. They have wars. They're jealous. There's so much sin in that world, and I love them. I want to rescue them. I'm going to become human, walk among them, let them kill me to take their sin upon me so that if they'll trust in me, they can be made clean and enter into life and then I'll put my DNA in them and make them like me and give them hope and a future and a reason for living and a purpose. And I'm the God that created all that and I'm full of love. He is Lord. I'm committed to the mission of Jesus because he is Lord. Here's a scripture, just one of many that might emphasize that. Psalm 103, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. Romans 14, Paul says this, for none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. Alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to God. I'm committed to Jesus' mission of making disciples of every nation. And I have some passion about it because I love Jesus, because I trust Jesus, but ultimately because he's Lord and I'm not. And everything I have, my life and my death, my every breath, is from him and for him. And the only way my life ever makes sense and has meaning and is full of joy and peace is when I live like that. When I live like he's not God, everything falls apart. Have you had that experience? When you live like you're God, it's not so good. And yet everything in us says, I want to be the one in charge. I want to do it my way. And then when we do, we crash it. But when he's in charge and he's Lord, we're blessed, he's honored, and the world begins to make sense. And his command is this. You who have followed me are to go into the entire planet and find every person you can and make disciples of them. Help them to follow me and then teach them everything that you've learned about me that I've taught you. And teach them also to go and make disciples and teach the next disciple about everything that you've learned. That's the missions gene. If you love Jesus, if you trust Jesus, if you recognize that he is Lord, consider at least the possibility that he would like to inject into you the missions gene so that you care about what Jesus cares about. Now, commitment, you care about something, you're committed to it. Commitment is measured in terms, I think, as I've heard this and it works for my life, time, energy, and money. If you want to know what's important to me, all you need is a copy of my calendar and a copy of my bank statement. And you'll know what I'm committed to. Isn't that true? So... I'm, you see where I'm going. I'm calling you to make a commitment to Jesus' mission. And you can look at yourself and see if you've committed by looking at your calendar. That's where you spend your time and your energy. And your bank account. Have you put any money toward Jesus' mission? So when you hear me say, I hope to pastor a church where everybody is involved with their money and their time in Jesus' mission. That's a bigger picture of what I'm talking about. That's not just like, oh, that's a nice go around, the fundraiser. No, <laughs> this is a life. When I was 17 years old, I graduated from high school. And there was a missionary of sorts, who came to a people group, the people group of high school students. He was with an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. His name was Doug. He led a Bible study that I went to. 
he would be on campus and help people find Jesus, help them become disciples, and teach them everything that Jesus taught him by reading the Bible with them. And he gave his life to it. So when I was 17 and I graduated from high school, I said, Doug, I think I want to support you financially. And that's when I started supporting missions. That was my first missionary. Now I'm really old. I'm 56, I think, 56. I'll turn 57 next month. So this was 40 years ago, a generation. I can tell you that I would like you to be like me in this manner. I've never once thought, dang, I wish I hadn't wasted all that money on Doug. <laughs> Just think, I could have had a, well, at that time, a bigger boom box <laughs> and more cassettes. <laughs> I've never, ever thought that. And it grew from there to where I've supported other missions and missionaries my whole life, and I've never, ever regretted it. The only thing I've thought is, could I give more? Because it's joyful for me to love Jesus, trust him, and follow him. In addition, I've had the opportunity to visit some nations, to go and preach the gospel, to go and make disciples in places where I didn't speak their language or another culture. And in our church, we've had the opportunity to be senders. Remember what we read about sent and senders? So I'm asking you, join me and have your heart move to the mission of Jesus. If you are not already involved with your time, energy, and money in supporting Jesus' mission in the earth, then I would encourage you, invite you to join us. You don't need to. There are many places to do this. We're just one in, of many, but we as a community have a missions program where we support people that take care of orphans, people that preach the gospel to places that have never heard the gospel, people that translate the Bible for people that don't have the word of God in their language, and many more. Next week, I'll tell you some more about the details of who we support. But we help them go because we're senders, and then we also go. Like I told you, I'm praying about going to Zambia. Steve said he's invited to go back to Honduras. There will be more. You can go. You can pray. You can send. But you can care because you've got the missions Gene. So Sh Shannon told you earlier that if you can, I'm going to put that, that sign up or that graphic up again. I'm not going to. Those guys are going to, I think. The one that says, if you'd like to join our missions program here, text the word missions to that number, 237-4393. In about 30 seconds or so, it will respond to you. It's kind of slow. <laughs> With a link where you can click on that link and just indicate how you want to participate. By the way, if you commit to give financially, we do not have a financial collection team <laughs> of guys from the men's ministry that show up at your house saying, hand it over. <laughs> no one named Guido is on our staff. <laughs> no, we're not, no. We will never do that. But, but you will you'll be thinking about your commitment from month to month. And, and what I say is financially, I suspect if you are an American, you can afford $5 a month because you probably smoke or drink coffee. <laughs> and usually people that don't smoke or drink coffee seem to have more money. So... <laughs> so if I commit to give $5 to something, especially this way, on a monthly basis, every time I do my $5 gift, I stop and think about it and pray about it. And now missions is on my mind and in my bank account and in my time, and it might move into my energy. Our goal as a family right now is to, amongst us, to commit to $2,000 a month, which is very doable with that but we'll talk about that more later. Anyway, the missions gene, Christian DNA, I think this is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and I think we saw that just in the words of Jesus. So that's for you that are part of our family. Now, those of you that are not part of our church family that are listening, I, I still hope that was truth to help you. You heard me say, though, that Paul wrote these words, those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and be saved. That's another way to say they'll be born again spiritually. They'll get this Christian DNA. And if you're hearing my voice, and there's something in you that says, I think that's true. There is a God who became man, named Jesus, who died on a cross to take away my sins. And if I put my faith in him, he'll take away my sins and give me a new life, make me alive spiritually. I want to do that. And you've never done that? Right now is your chance to put your faith in Jesus, and I want to invite you to do that. Lord, I'm, I'm talking to you now, and I'm asking that if there's anyone hearing me that needs to put their faith in you, that you, God the Holy Spirit, will make it ring loud inside their inner being that you're calling them. Let them hear your invitation, come follow me. Holy Spirit, do that work. Thank you, God. And now I'm talking to you. If you're hearing something inside that says, come, follow me, put your trust in me, that's God Almighty. If you're listening online, you're watching on Zoom, you're watching on Facebook, you're in the building, that's God speaking to you. And respond something like this. I, I, you, the words are your words reflecting your heart, but something like, I hear you, God. I hear your invitation. I believe that you want to accept me into your heart. So I say yes. I want to follow you. And I want you to be Lord. I give you the keys to my life. I'm sorry for resisting you all this time. You are now Lord, and I'm your child. I love you, I trust you. Wash away my sins and give me 